you know, the, the funny thing about Frank Meyer and doing this seminar is that it's, you know, it's an exploration. You know, I, I would like to say that we have all the answers about his life and what had happened and even some of the most simple questions about Frank Meyer are still ones that are left to be answered, which is, which is great because hopefully people, you know, going forward will continue to do research about him and his work and his life. So, I mean, compared to some of the other bartenders, I mean, thanks to Dave and, and, and Fernando, we, we know a lot about them. You know, even people, you know, obviously Jerry Thomas, you know, in the late, mid to late 1800s, we know a lot about his life. Um, Frank Meyer, you know, worked in the 1900s and we, you know, he was a secretive person and, you know, he lived in some very, very interesting times. So a lot of it is still us trying to figure out what it is. So today's discussion is almost, uh, you know, three people who've looked into this and kind of comparing notes. I don't know if we'll always agree or uh, we've maybe found uh, different conflicting sources or opinions about his life. But there may even be fisticuffs now. <laughs> <laughs> if we can only hope. Um, but I think it's, it's exciting. So um, without further ado, I guess uh, we'll, we'll get into it. And of course, uh, the down, Philip Duff makes me say this, but download the app. Uh, the Wi-Fi code is up there if you need it. Uh, and afterwards, uh, please rate the seminar. Uh, like Uber, we want five stars, I guess, but uh, whatever that means. But uh, Well, I guess really for, for, there's, you know, there aren't, I, up until recently, I had not seen many photos of Frank Meyer. Fernando has turned up in short order, I think, more photos than anybody ever thought existed about Frank Meyer in the last couple of weeks in preparation for this. So this is often the most famous shot, um, you know, the Ritz Paris, I got this one from the Ritz, um, that they use, uh, you know, this is, we'll, we'll see in a little bit more photos of him, but um, here's all of our uh, Twitter handles and everything. So uh, I guess really let's, you know, talk a little bit about his, his early years. I mean, he's most famous for his time in France, but, you know, it seems, you know, from what Dave, you found, he started his training in, in New York um, at the Hoffman House, which... Yeah, he, he, he came over for, he was, he was born in... Uh, in Austria, part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the great empire that is no more of, of Eastern Europe, a very weird and cosmopolitan place. But he was born on April 3rd, uh, 1884, as uh, his Paris police file, which Fernando will tell us about uh, uh, much later, or somewhat later, as that tells us over and over again. Uh, and he was born in this little tiny town called Kirchberg, uh, South East Austria, really in the middle of like the Tyrol and the mountains, a kind of place where the, the people tend to be fairly self sufficient and closed mouthed to begin with. It's, uh, they're, they're not Italians up there. <laughs> you know, they're, uh, they're, they're pretty quiet. And he was one of these people. And in 1902, 1903, we don't know with what experience, but you know, he was 18 years old. He comes to New York. Uh, and in New York, for seven months, he works at the Hoffman House. The Hoffman House was the famous hotel bar in New York. It was on Broadway and 25th Street. Uh, the best bar in New York City history. Uh, Certainly uh, up until recent years. It's a very, very famous place. Uh, had some of the most famous bartenders were there. Uh, Charlie Mahoney, the, uh, their head bartender, wrote the book on bartending at the time. Uh, it was, it was this, this absolutely luxurious place where uh, you could easily spend a dollar on a cocktail wow. at a time when cocktails were two for a quarter in most places. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, Scandalous uh, Sc oil paintings. Scandalous but. oil paintings of, uh, of nymphs and satyrs playing around <laughs> with a lot of pink flesh on display and all kinds of crazy stuff. But the, the interesting thing about, about this story is the fact that he got a job there at all. I mean, this was like, it's, it's like, you know, walking into the, uh, the modern top hotel bar uh, at the Nomad in New York and, at 18 years old and getting a job somehow. So clearly he had some kind of hotel experience or something to get this job. He clearly knew enough English to lie his way into it at least. And uh, so he got this job, worked there for seven months, which isn't a long time. 
but it's certainly long enough to, uh, to, to know the ropes. And the things he would have learned there were uh, all the standard popular drinks, martinis, Manhattans, old fashions, juleps still, especially at an old fashioned place like that, fizzes, uh, Ricky's, the new hot drink, the Mamie Taylor summer drink, as, as, at least if his uh, seven months included the summer. Uh, he would have learned uh, the American bar gear, the strainers, the, 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 the shakers, the, the lemon squeezers, all that kind of stuff. I mean, basically thorough education in uh, the modern art of mixing drinks. In seven months, I think at a top bar, I think you can learn that. If you don't learn that, you don't stay there for seven months. I mean, you basically have to learn very fast. So clearly, uh, he was uh, a wide awake young man who, who knew what he was doing. Uh, but in 1903, he uh, packs up and, as far as we know, goes back to Europe. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, we're, we're discussing um, a little bit in, in our preparation about even the basic fact of whether or not Frank Meyer was. Jewish. I mean, like, uh, you know, I, according, you know, for the story, like, Talar had said that one of one of his ancestors was so that... He said that, but we, we didn't found on yeah. our side yeah. something about it. The, the, the Paris police records during occupation by the Nazis did not mention this, and uh, they were not very friendly to him, and I think that would have been something that uh, would have... Would have come uh, up. ...sent him to a camp and, and to death, so... Yeah. Uh, we don't know, but if he was Jewish, he wasn't very Jewish. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. Right. He was not known. Yeah, it was, Paris, he kept it quiet. Uh, well, maybe, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, he didn't go to synagogue. He yeah. did not go. So, <laughs> he well, didn't keep kosher. <laughs> well, and then at the, the, the turn of the century, you know, we have him, you know, returning obviously to France a few mm -hmm. years later. Um, you know, we, we have uh, on the right is obviously you know World War One. Soldier, it's not it's not Frank Meyer, but uh, somebody of that time. I guess what, at that point, did we see a lot of bartenders going to New York and then coming back to, to France, you know, to, to use that American style, to introduce that American style of bartending to, to European customers? Well, I, the other bartender just as famous as him in uh, Europe at the time was Harry Craddock, who was English went to Cincinnati and then New York, worked, I believe, at the Holland House in New York, another one of these great hotel bars, and then went back and uh, at Prohibition went and worked at the Savoy forever and you know, kind of became the, the head of the English School of Bartending. And he and Frank Meyer were essentially the two uh, European pillars of, of, of classic mixology at the time. Right. So I think, it, you know, there were other people who did it, too. Yeah. It, was, it was pretty common. Uh, and, for example, both became a honor president of the first bartender association in each country. So it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Not it's president, a, honor president. So. Uh, it, was very, it was very prestigious to have some uh, American, and in particular New York, experience if you were behind the bar in some of these European places, especially because a lot of your customers would be American, yeah. you know, and, and they would expect that you knew uh, how to speak American, how to, uh, <laughs> how to, uh, how a bar worked, you would know maybe some of the jokes, you would know all, all this stuff. So that, there's a lot of expectation uh, there. Uh, one of the great bartenders in Paris at the time was this guy, Henry Tepe, who was a, a German who learned how to tend bar in England, but uh, used to tell people about his experience in America, which consisted of getting off a boat in Hoboken when he was 16 years old. He was a sailor walking around for the afternoon and then getting back on the boat. So <laughs> it wasn't essential to have American right. experience, but it certainly helped. And then I guess he, he comes back, and, and you had, Dave, you had found this uh, amazing photo of him. Uh, oh, yeah. He, he, he uh, according to one article, and it's really finding biographical information on Frank Meyer is very difficult. He rarely talked to the press. He was a private guy. He was an elegant guy. His friends were rich. He didn't really need to go out there and 
self-promote. He had enough money. Uh, he, you know, he didn't really need to build a career. He was at the top practically from the beginning. So he didn't, he, he didn't talk a lot. Uh, and finding information, but there was one interview in the New York Sun in the 1930s, in 1933, Paris Farman here on holiday, mm -hmm. where they managed to get a photo of him and some, some conversation with him. And he talked about coming back from New York after mm -hmm. his seven months at the Hoffman House. This is the article. And uh, going uh, eventually around 1908 to 1914. So what he did in between, I certainly don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any idea? No, we don't know. We don't, know. we don't know what he did before the Hoffman House. We don't know what he did for a couple of years after. But in 1908 uh, through 1914, he, he owns this bar, the Brunswick Bar, which is a, a small bar at, uh, on the Rue de Capuchin, which is right around the corner from where Harry's New York Bar is now. And uh, this bar... Uh, boasted of the first bowling alley in Europe. You can see it there in the corner. So do you think One it, lane bowling alley. Do you think it was called the Brunswick because of the bowling? It, it's quite possible, yeah. Possible, and also the area, the Duke, Duke of Brunswick was living there mm. in the ah. history of Paris. <laughs> oh, so, so there you go. The, the link. I mean, but the, it, it's also interesting that usually in the bars you had billiard. Huh. No bowling, so he had found a way to be innovative. Well, also, I, I, I think the reason for that is the neighborhood he was in. And I want to talk about that very, just yeah. very quickly. This, the, the neighborhood where the Ritz is, right now if you go, it's still there. It's right off Place Vendôme in Paris, just a couple hundred yards north of the Louvre, uh, on, the, you know, on, the, on, the, on the right bank, on the kind of the, uh, the, 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 the business bank of the river. Uh, and in between where it is and the Paris Opera House, which is a, a few hundred yards from there, that was starting in the 1850s. That was the American sector of Paris. That was the American neighborhood. And there were like 5,000 Americans living in Paris at least. They had bars. They had restaurants. They had Brentano's bookstore there. So you could get American books, not just English books, but American yeah. books. You know, uh, the French were our huge friends in uh, the revolution. And uh, we tended to look very kindly on France. Historically, uh, Americans did. I know we've had our issues after World War II, and it sort of clouded that relationship. But it used to be very close, and it used to be the place where young Americans went or where Americans went to get away, uh, where they were respected and felt comfortable and uh, had a good time. And there were all these American bars there. Uh, the earliest one I've been able to find was uh, there are four Henrys involved in this story. So this is Henry number one was Henry James, a freed slave from uh, Robertson County, Kentucky, who uh, uh, moved to uh, Paris and opened his bar on Rue Castiglione, which is right there, leading into Place Vendôme, uh, in between Place Vendôme and the Louvre. And he was making uh, Robertson County cocktails with bourbon and uh, just really just making American cocktails. And he was the first real pioneer there. Uh, well. Not the first, because even earlier, a guy called Keeney, I don't even know his first name, uh, took over the Café Le Blonde on the Boulevard des Italiens, which is sort of on the northern end of this, uh, this area. And uh, the Café Le Blonde uh, had all the American drinks, all the, the timber doodles, the, uh, the punches, <laughs> The, uh, the smashes, the, the, the next juleps. Year's seminar, we'll do one on the timber doodle. Yeah, the t it's going to be timber doodle okay. like, that's going to be the drink of, the, of, of tales. 2017, come back <laughs> we'll be here. the timber doodle. First, we have to figure out what it is. But uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, there are all these fancy American drinks. So uh, Cafe Le Blonde was very popular. It was open very late in the evening, and, uh, and it had American drinks from 1849, so that's even earlier. Uh, 1865 on Rue Scribe, which is really right there, right around, uh, also around the corner from where Harry's Bar, which is the last survivor now, uh, along with the Ritz Bar, where that is. That had the Grand Café, which was an American bar. Uh, in uh, sometime around 1870, uh, a German named Henry Holzschuh, so not an American, founds an American bar uh, at the Hotel Chatham. Uh, around, across the street from where Harry's Bar is on Rue Downu. 
1890, you get uh, uh, Henry Tepe, the guy who went to Hoboken for a few hours, uh, has Henry's Bar, which became the American bar in Paris. Very, very popular place, very, very much loved. Uh, finally, uh, uh, sorry, uh, oh, yeah. uh, William Boothby, mention him. Oh, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Marguerite cocktail. Yeah. Another uh, famous uh, cocktail, William Boothby from San Francisco. From San Francisco, wrote a book, The World's Drinks, and he Which talks was about. Which very Yeah. Know, it's international recipes, yeah? Yeah, and it was international recipes, and he had the marguerite, which is a variation on the dry martini from Otto at Henry's Bar. Uh, Henry, unfortunately, jumped out of a window in 1918, uh, the, and uh, so that was a problem. Uh, <laughs> The, the final, the fourth Henry, is Milton Henry, a jockey, a winning jockey who took his winnings and did what uh, athletes did always before they had uh, sports associations to uh, pay their retirement. And he opened a bar in Paris. Uh, uh, you know, he, he'd been a winning jockey in Europe. He was American. Uh, Milton Henry and his wife, uh, they bought a bar in New Jersey the, uh, and, and shipped the, uh, the furnishings over there uh, to Five Rue Downu. Uh, in, uh, and they called it the New York Bar and uh, so, sold hot dogs and cocktails. And it's still in operation now as Harry's mm -hmm. New York Bar. Uh, Harry took it over in 1923. There were several other American bars. The last one I wanted to talk about is kind of the best one. It opens uh, sometime around 1870. It's got uh, three partners and a silent partner. Uh, the three partners are Piano Charlie Bullard, Big Ike Marsh and Adam Worth. Uh, the silent partner uh, is, uh, uh, God, I'm having a mental block. But uh, he's the silent partner, so we don't have to Doesn't worry about him. Uh, but uh, the important thing about these three guys is uh, their names sound a little shifty because uh, they got their money, which is half a million dollars, by tunneling through the wall of the Boylston Bank in uh, Boston in 1869 and took that half million dollars and took it to Paris and opened a bar. And over the next different times, four different or times. five years, that bar caused more trouble in Paris than anything you've ever heard of. There are always people getting shot in there. There are always people getting arrested. <laughs> They're always tracking down international fugitives there. It was the shiftiest most crazy ass bar imaginable. It was called the Cosmopolitan, of course. Of course. <laughs> <You know? Of> course. <laughs> and what it was was the Cosmopolitan uh, Association of International Crooks. <laughs> and they're all drinking gin cocktails. Uh, uh, the bartenders were American. Eventually, these guys sold to a John Coney, who was English, but who had spent time in America. And this, this bar lasted for a long time, I believe. Uh, and it was, it was very famous. Uh, you know, the, uh, eventually Pinkertons caught up with the, 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 the detectives, <laughs> caught up with the, with the bank robbers. Uh, but these guys still kept going. Uh, gin cocktails and uh, brandy and so soda flow unceasingly at this Maybe. place, as one of the guys who was there uh, said. And that, that's, you know, it's all like really right around the corner from where Harry's Bar is now. So this is like the world uh, that the Brunswick Bar was in, uh, where a guy who spent seven months at the Hoffman House could put in a bowling alley and claim he's running an American bar. Uh, and this is the world, and you know, that's right around the corner from the Ritz Bar, which do, we'll be talking about. Do we about. have a sense of what, like, I mean, I guess the Brunswick Bar would also be serving similar cocktails to? Uh... Yeah, it would be serving, at this point, uh, Manhattans, martinis, uh, there are very few European cocktails as, okay. as of yet. You know, they're mostly just making American drinks. Most of their clientele is American. Or English. Or English, yeah, exactly. The French who do come in tend to be sporty types, international types, who, uh, you know, they'll drink uh, a l'Americaine there. Yeah. You know, they, if they want to drink French style, there are a million bars where they can do that and drink absinthe and... and uh, I would imagine his, his signature drink, which you're enjoying today, the bee's knees, that comes later, I guess? I, I would think yeah, later. probably later. We, yeah, we, we, we don't know what the, you know, the very little information on the Brunswick bar survives. Yeah, and, I, and even when it closed, I, he goes to, Meyer goes to World War One, right? Yeah. He enlists, and I guess at that point maybe the, the bar closed. I don't, I don't know, and he, he served, obviously, in World War One. is able to come back at that point. Uh, you know, well, I mean, he didn't just serve. Right. He, he 
signed up in August 1914, right when World War I started. He was in Morocco. He signed up in the French Foreign Legion. He was an Austrian citizen. And he was mustered out of the French Foreign Legion in January 1920. So that's five, five years. years. The Foreign Legion uh, did not sit around in their barracks <laughs> polishing their bayonets during World War I. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, trench warfare, yeah, uh, mustard gas. They were in the middle of everything. They were at the Battle of Verdun. They were at every battle. So it's, I mean, it's pretty miraculous that he survived at all. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He never talked about it. Yeah. And just after that, opening the read. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. He comes back from the war. I mean, obviously, in Paris, it's a great time of creativity. You have. You know, all of these amazing characters are, are there, um, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, he already made a reputation in Paris to be able to be chosen by the Ritz after, after that. Yeah, the, Brun the Brunswick bar must have been good, yeah. you know, if, yeah. if, 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 he, if he had, if he could get hired by the Ritz. He five years. Yeah, also, also and, probably uh, the five years in the Foreign Legion <laughs> must have helped a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> well, and according to Colin Field, who's the head bartender at the bar Hemingway at the Ritz now, he told me that, that Frank Meyer was the first head bartender that the Ritz ever had. Like it wasn't, it was a job almost created for him. So it sort of shows how good he must have been for him to come in. This was a famous hotel already with celebrities, you know, and very well known. Yeah, I wonder if, if they didn't, you know, uh, put in these new, because they put in two bars. Right. He was in charge of two bars in, in starting in like the early 20s. I wonder if those weren't new, newly created uh, yeah, uh, the, to, to the, capitalize on the, prohibition. The Ruta Cambombo is, you know, one, one of them still exists. One of them is now where Bar Hemingway is. Yeah, it was only. The, the, the reopened it, but it was, they're just, one is here and the other one is in front. So the one for the men only. And so a woman couldn't get in for a long time oh. until she was a military. Uh, and, and in the ladies' bar, just in front, a man couldn't go without a lady. So and, and, really and the ladies' bar was tiny. It was 15 feet by 15 feet, so five meters by five meters. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was tiny. Uh, it was also known as the Black Hole of Calcutta or the Steam Room because it was so crowded. Uh, but because that's where everybody wanted to be. Yeah, See, it really was at the ladies' bar. That was where all the action was. All, all, that was where all the American film actresses went. That's where everybody drank champagne cocktails like crazy. You know, that, that was like the lively one. And, and then that, there was the men's bar. And that became the bar Hemingway, right? The, the women's bar? Or? The women's bar became yeah. the bar but Hemingway. But they expanded yeah. it, though, yeah. for the bar yeah. Hemingway. Yeah. And across the hall was the other one. I, I have a description of the men's bar here from a great book called uh, The Paris That's Not in the Guidebooks uh, <laughs> from uh, 1929 by this guy, uh, Basil Woon, W-O-O-N, an amazing name. Amazing. And, and Basil Woon wrote these kind of books about everywhere in the world, sure. about like, you know, where to, where to get the good stuff. I think there, are, there are reprints of that now, right? I think there's one. Oh, is there? Yeah, yeah. I think so, yeah. All right. Oh, this is a... Uh, Cuba and London. Yeah, this is, yeah, he did Cuba, he did London, he did steamships, like what, what, wow. what steamships are the best to travel on, which ones have the best bars. This one, you know, the, the Paris that's not in the guidebooks uh, breaks down to two things, bars and whores. So, uh, uh, but this is the bar part, and we will leave the other part aside. Uh, he, uh, he says, uh, the bar is a large oblong room lined with tables with a serving bar at the farther end. The cream-tinted walls would perhaps be more in place in a parlor, but then Frank's bar is no common ordinary pothouse. It is, quote, a meeting place for gentlemen, as used to be advertised on Broadway. Certainly no saloon in the world has its distinguished clientele. Few can boast a more distinguished bartender. That's our guy Frank. Uh, they, they say, uh, Woon says, uh, Frank Meyer presiding over the mahogany. So he wasn't just the manager, he was also tending bar and actually making drinks there, which is important to know. And, and I think that, I'm not sure when that photo, again, from the Ritz, but I imagine that was from the men's bar and, you know, yeah. at some point. I mean, you know, again, Colin, you know, I've talked to him about it, sort of saying that he, in some ways, invented the, the sort of idea of the bartender being the host, you know, that he really saw himself as not just the guy who would make you drinks, but for certain special guests or frequent um, guests of the hotel who he'd gotten to know, there's a famous you know, story that he would always run out to the curb to meet mm -hmm. them when they came 
you know, they'd come to the hotel, he'd run, he'd literally grab their bags, pull them in. Um, and that's how, you know, he, he saw the hospitality as, as much more than just the bar, but that, you know, his bar was kind of, you know, the, the face of the hotel. And he will only mix the drinks for important people. Yeah, so the team is there to mix the drinks his right. way, but uh, when it's uh, king or someone <laughs> yeah. very important, he will mix the drinks. Well, I mean, this is a hotel where, like, Coco Chanel had a suite for, for decades, yeah. um, you know, who lived upstairs. Hemingway that's lived there for a long time. That's also thanks to Coco Chanel, the woman could go to the men's bar after. Right. So it's kind of amazing. I mean, oh, yeah. and then we have uh, down here is uh, it, Fernando had gotten these amazing photos. Uh, obviously, the first one that we started with is, is one from this series. And I, I had never, I mean, this is sort of like finding a Honus Wagner card in a, in a <laughs> you know, yeah, a know, box of used books to find, you know, this amazing uh, context. You, do, do you want, Fernando, you want to talk a little bit about yeah, how? It, it, I mean, it's a full series made about Frank Mayer by Roger Charles, who was a great uh, French uh, photographer who made a... I mean, thousands of pictures, of course, but he made about the World War, about many subjects, and he was uh, the photographer for all the big magazines, for Vogue. Uh, uh, and so we don't know why he made this series. It was in 1938. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's good to see him working, I would say. So uh, he, he, he was, uh, we, we only saw, maybe I saw three or four on the web since... 15 years, and now to see the full series was a, was a great surprise. And so, as I knew some existed, I tried to find them, and, uh, yeah. and I finished by searching for the, the name of the photographer to find if someone is managing the rights. And, and so his, uh, his uh, gr uh, granddaughter uh, had uh, doing some events into photography in Paris, and so I could contact her, and she sent me to her father, who managed the rights, and he sent me on the series, but just last week, so we get it's it. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I know. Searching for that. I so opened this email, years, and it's, it's like, what the hard. hell? <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah. And, that, and, and, and in the lower right, the, there's that photo of him talking to somebody, and that's... Yeah. Oh, that's this guy, uh, uh, Evander Barry Wall, B-E-R-R-Y. Uh, Barry Wall was uh, a Hoffman House uh, denizen in the 1880s and 1890s. He was a dandy. He was like the, the, the flashiest dresser in New York, which <laughs> took some doing back then because uh, there was no income tax. Right. <laughs> you know, rich people dressed up, and boy right. did he dress up. He would change his suit like three times a day. Uh, and, and he eventually retired after Prohibition rolled around, he, you know, he, after spending a checkered career as champagne salesman and uh, a rich playboy around town, he finally retired to Paris. And that's him. The, he died in 1938. So the last, probably the last photo of him. You can barely see it here, but he's got a high wing collar, this really fairly extreme outfit on. Uh, Search on the web because it's it, amazing. It, it's pretty amazing the way he's dressed. Yeah. And he was a real character. He wrote an amazing autobiography also called Neither Pest Nor Puritan, which is full of uh, racy anecdotes about the rich and famous and, uh, and is, 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 is pretty damned entertaining. Uh, he was a real character. So it's, it's fun to see him. Clearly, you know, who knows? He might he may have might have known Frank from from his Hoffman House days. I was going to say that sort of proves maybe the link between his time at the Hoffman House and and, yeah, and, and here at the Ritz. I know it's a it's an yeah uh, yeah. Let me talk a little bit about Frank's character also here. Uh, you know, because he was so uh, he he was he was as a, as a, our friend Basil Wound says, Meyer has a speaking acquaintance with most of the great of the earth and has acted as guide and advisor to many whose names mean front page news. J.P. Morgan call, calls him by name, and he knows the favorite drink of every diplomat in Europe. Uh, all the fancy people came. If you were fancy, you could get into the bar. Uh, if you weren't fancy, you could get into the bar. You just wouldn't get served. Uh, it was one of those places. Like, they were extremely chilly. It was a cold bar. I mean, you know, cold to, to strangers. It was not a warm bar. The hospitality was very selective at the men's bar. At the ladies' bar, anything goes. But uh, that's why the people like that one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, as this says, uh, his personality has little of servility in it, despite the fact that, as he will tell you, my clients are my god. Well, he, his clients are not the same as his customers. 
you know, he'd choose his clients among his customers because the rest of them could go to hell. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, little servility after five years in the Foreign Legion, right. I kind of think that, you know, he didn't really have to take anything from anybody and wasn't about to, so uh, he just kind of went and did his thing. Uh, as this says also, uh, besides being the most courted, Frank is also the most feared man in Parisian society because people told him stuff. You know, he was their bartender, of the bartender to the rich and the powerful, like the old banking families, the old uh, moneyed landowners, those people he was friendly with, and they would get to drinking and they'd talk to him a little, and then he'd keep those secrets. Which is maybe also, going back to his heritage, maybe some reason why his Jewish ancestors was sort of like a secret or not very well known, or yeah. that because he was just so well connected to, you know, who stays there. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, you know, it, it sounds, this whole thing sounds very romantic, but in fact, the modern Ritz is the same way. Yeah, <laughs> like, so that, you know, um, the bartender who have a photo of uh, later on for, of Colin Field, like, wrote a, a book about um, cocktails a few years ago, mm -hmm. and the supermodel Kate Moss wrote the intro to his book about cocktails and called it her home away from home. I mean, could you imagine, like, Kate Moss calling your bar <laughs> home away from home? It's not a very large bar. And the fact that, you know, she says, you know, writes about how, you know, she's missed many an appointment because she mm -hmm. goes there and, you know, Colin, you know, has, you yeah. know, trapped her with his, you know, his, well, his drink. So I'll give you the other side of that. I, I only w drank at Colin's bar once. Uh, I was a junior drink writer. This was maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, he gave me one of those hand handshakes and that was the last I saw of him. <laughs> <laughs> I was introduced to him. He was not impressed. I did not get a drink made by Colin Field. <laughs> and something about the book, the original uh, print was only 1,000 copy. So it's very small. But what mm -hmm. is interesting when we are talking about the list of clientele, because out of these 1,000 copies, 300 were numbered and already printed for someone. OK? Yeah. And we don't have the list. Right. And we would love to have it. But just to tell you an example, the number 85 was for Kermit Roosevelt. Just to give you the number 85. Yeah, Teddy Roosevelt's son. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, that's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. So it would be really surprising to have. And the, and the 26 first was letters. So must have been the 26th most important. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, I mean, this was really a club, you know, the men's bar there. It was, it was supposedly the hotel bar, but it was really a club for the, for the, for the, for the most powerful, the richest, the, uh, the, the, the movers and shakers. And, uh, and for them, Frank would, uh, would, uh, would do anything. And uh, that gives you a lot of power. And in many ways, Paris at that time was sort of the center of, of Europe. I mean, it was, you know, it was New York and Paris. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of hard to... to and and even, mm -hmm. even if you had many American bars, anyway, the Ritz, from what I heard, because I had the chance to interview two bartenders, uh, trainers, and uh, who worked at the Ritz with Frank Mayer, and, uh, and, and, and one who started there in, in 39 told me, anyway, that uh, the bar did the business in two hours. Two hours at midday and two hours at the aperit. That's wow. it. In That's fact, <laughs> all the money was made during that time. <laughs> then but that's why they had the ladies' bar, right. which was yeah. busy all the time, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to, to, yeah. uh, exactly. you know to, 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 make the, to make the rest of the money. And, and, and even if they made a lot of money, they were not kidding about the, the measure. You know, today we use a jigger, right, yeah. to be very precise. But the, the Jacques Hébrard told me an example. It was when the bottle was empty, you had to leave it like that for a moment to get the last dash from the bottle. <laughs> so maybe two Every, weeks. Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, uh, certainly uh, a good businessman. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Now, uh, but the funny thing is, according to Frank Meyer, the drinks there were not super expensive. He said the drinks were uh, seven francs or about 30 cents for, for the average straight drink. And that kind of goes with what we know about the super rich. You know, they're, they're also, they didn't get super rich for, for no reason. Uh, I mean, uh, they're, they're not going to go there to get ripped off. You could buy more expensive drinks. Uh, you could get sidecars made with Napoleon Cognac from the Ritz's cellars, and those would be very expensive. Five, 
$5? Yeah, five, exactly. That would be instead of 30 cents, that would be $5. But I think the average straightforward drinks, you know, he, he, he was very smart. He's like, I'm not going to overcharge these people. I'm going to make this place super exclusive. And he made his personal fortune because he did make a fortune. He drove a, what, a Rolls Royce or a, he had some very fancy car. I can't remember what. Yeah. Uh, but he, he, he made it selling lottery tickets and holding bets for people, which is what American bars had always done. Like the Hoffman House, uh, Billy Edwards, the Hoffman House bouncer, and Charlie Mahoney, the head bartender at the turn of the last century. These guys made a fortune off of uh, holding stakes on bets. Uh, you know, you, you'd, somebody would bet on a sporting event, two different guys, they'd each pay their bet, and he'd hold on to the money until the, until, uh, the bet was settled and you know until the, the event was over, then he'd get a percentage. And uh, Frank Meyer basically made a Vegas. lot of money. It's a <laughs> good Vegas business. Vegas style. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, so you're basically, it's Vegas style, you're the house. You know, you get a percentage no matter who wins. Which also set him up very well for, for World War II. And we have uh, Fernando was able, amazingly enough, to find his uh, Gestapo police record, I guess, or from Vichy, France. And there it is. I mean, it goes on. I mean, it's quite detailed, as you can see. I mean, it's just pages and pages of information about him. So clearly, he was a person of interest. They knew what he was up to. World War II starts. Things change quite a bit at the Ritz. Like uh, Herman Goring takes a suite upstairs at the Ritz. That's his base, but it's kind of amazing because you know most of the staff no, uh, interviewing Talar Mazeo is saying that a lot of the staff you know either worked for the resistance or was at least sympathetic to the resistance. So you had all the staff working there, and even the owners of the Ritz and the manager, um, you know, are, are sympathetic. You know, and and helping the resistance, whereas a lot of the people staying there are are Nazis. And Coco Chanel has her suite. She's at that point, her boyfriend is a high-ranking uh, Nazi who may or may not have been a double agent, but I don't think she knew that. Um, <laughs> but uh, she she wasn't a particularly nice person. Uh, although uh, it's kind of funny now that the Ritz has a Coco Chanel suite. I don't mm -hmm. knowing more and more about her, I'm not sure who'd want to actually stay in that suite, but. Um, that's a different story. Uh, but I, I, Fernando, do you want to talk about a little bit where, where you were able to find the report yeah, and, and in what's the, in there? the archive of the police in Paris because in the bartender I interview, uh, they told me he could have been in prison at the end just uh, because he died in 1947. So just after World War II, he left the Ritz and uh, they told me maybe after jail, uh, they killed him in uh, interior. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, then... Uh, so I went to the archives of the police to try to find that, uh, how, how much time he spent in, uh, in jail, but he, 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 was not, he was not there. But he was arrested uh, by the, the SFI, which was a kind of French police, a secret police. And uh, it seems that uh, arrested with his son and uh, niece, and to be delivered, they stayed three days uh, prisoner. And uh, mm -hmm. to be uh, delivered, he had to pay 300,000 French francs. So maybe it's part of his, his fortune and it's probably a bad moment for him. So after mm -hmm. that, they could be delivered. And then we don't know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. The, the, I was looking through these files as well. And uh, you see during, you know, this is in occupied Paris, Nazi-occupied French police are under the control of the Nazis. Uh, and the French police call him in uh, or first, they keep a file on him because uh, they're trying to do a benefit for uh, bartenders, the, 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 the French Bartenders Union in 1941. I mean, people are suffering, you know, uh, the, the under occupation and, uh, and people aren't working and uh, there's no more tourism. The Nazis, uh, the only tourists you get are German soldiers and they're not exactly going to be paying through the nose for, for anything. Uh, and, and so the, he and a couple other prominent bartenders try to uh, put up this, uh, this, uh, this benefit. And the police are asked, you know, who are these guys? Obviously asked by the Germans. You know, and so, so the police do a little investigation of, 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 the, uh, of the, these bartenders, including Frank Meyer. And they get a little bio of him. You know, he, uh, he was uh, German or Austrian, then naturalized. Uh, in France in 1921, uh, divorced, uh, 
He, uh, he head bartender of the Ritz forever. Uh, and then we have no problem with him. You know, he's been cooperative, in other words. So it, it, it's, he's OK. Oh, and they, they mentioned his military service in World War I, which is where we found out that he was in the Foreign Legion, which was, we found this out last week when you got the record. Hey. That was a real eye opener, because the Foreign Legion is badass. Uh, so anyway, uh, so you see, you see the, 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 the occupation didn't ostensibly have a problem with him. Which, which is funny because, like, the, in, in the, the failed plot to assassinate Hitler, um, some of the frequent guests at the bar, uh, Hans Spiegel and Karl von Stupenagel, mm -hmm. you know, try to, try to um, kill Hitler and also, I guess, Goring, too, and it doesn't work. But, you know, Meyer, some people think, helped them curry notes back and forth. Part of it was that since he was already taking bets as a bookie, that a lot of it wasn't suspicious for people to be having kind of secretive conversations with him, giving him notes, giving him having him pass out notes. I mean, it was all under it could be under the guise of his gambling operation, but he could really be helping the resistance by giving out information. Uh, I, I don't know. Well, there, there is one weird little document in the in the police file, and it's this just little like type thing from. Late summer 1944, after uh, uh, Paris had, had fallen to the Allies, and I think it's a resistance group. I'm not sure. Saying uh, this guy's actually okay, uh, which is interesting because maybe somebody knew something. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we we don't know. This is this is like some weird secret type stuff. I mean, the the Ritz did a lot of weird resistance to the Germans. But part of that was just maintaining normal hotel keeping and working around conditions. For instance, the Germans took half the hotel to put senior officers in. And uh, the other half of the hotel, they, uh, they emptied out, right? And the, the Ritz said, well, can we you know, use, continue to use this for our regulars? And the Germans said, fine. But uh, the Ritz didn't have any beds. So they took the second beds out of all the Germans' rooms. <laughs> you know, so it's like, uh, you know, it's like, oh, you don't need this. We're just going to, you know, we're going to make, give you a little more room here. I'm sure they were very pleasant about it. But what they secretly were doing is putting it right. in the other half of the hotel so they could fill it full of French people and, you know, their guests and their, 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 their regulars and their, so, their, their, their social set. And, you know, who knows what Frank was involved with with that with uh, black market activities. Getting, getting people passports, getting uh, people, fake, yeah, fake, I mean, fake papers. There were a couple examples of like known Jewish guests who he was able to get fake passports for papers to, you know, saying that, that allowed them to stay there and, and out of the grass. Even. They were probably his regulars, you know? Absolutely, G getting people <laughs> you out know? of, you know, out of yeah. screening them from prison, getting them fake papers. So, I mean, it was really, uh, you know, it's kind of amazing where, you know, during the day he's serving Nazis, you know, behind their back. He's, you know, I mean, risking his life, everybody, I mean, the whole staff's life, you know, to, to do these things. And uh, I mean, clearly this was, this was a well-known practice, at least to the Ritz staff, that what was going on there. Uh, for, for me, the question is how much of it was, like, altruistic or, you know, furthering the, the Allied war effort and how much of it was just being a fixer for his regulars. Like, you know, right. he always was. You know, he, he took their bets. He, 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 he was, you know, you don't get to be in the position he had before the war without being like somebody who can make things well, happen for people, who can fix their problems. Suffice it to say, though, that he didn't switch his allegiance to, like, the Nazis, which no. I think a lot of people there, if it was purely, you know, economical or... Uh, might have done that or been tempted to do that. Yeah, the Paris police records never had him as an informer either. Yeah. You know, he did, at least in what's, the, what's his left there. His niece was uh, from the German secret services. Because there is a word that yeah. they think it could be because they didn't know anything about her. Uh, she was unemployed and we don't know where he, she get the money from. Huh. Well, and then I guess, you know, we'll talk a little bit about his strengths at, at the Ritz. Um, obviously, there's the book, and it's kind of, I mean, the book is kind of amazing because it's not only recipes, but there's also all types of advice in the back. 
um, you know, that you would need for everyday life, including a whole chapter on like cleaning things like uh, marble and uh, all types yeah. of conversion charts. And I mean, can, can I can I read some yeah, of these please, quickly? Sure. Uh, the back of the book, you get like alcohol, comparative strengths, antidotes for poisons, differences of time, like time zones around the world, nautical miles, you know, can. Uh, converting those to regular ones. Very good for the size of the Earth, the map good. of the Earth with distances. I guess this is good for uh, settling bar bets too. Yeah, uh, exactly. Pressure, comparative temperatures and measures, weights and measures, and you know many pages of those. Uh, useful information. <laughs> how, what is a horsepower? I think <laughs> one is picking blood out of like fabric, if yeah. I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. Lots on horse racing, like a little yeah. history of the turf. You know, it's just, it's the kind of the classic, like, a bunch of guys hanging around in a bar, you know, before we had smartphones. Like, Absolutely. what comes up? You know, Absolutely. it's like we got questions. Uh, who's going to settle my bet here? Well, and amazingly enough, like, you know, through the recipes, like, they're, for the ones that he created, he puts his, like, little initials, yeah. his Art Deco initials, and that's how we know that the bee's knees was his, or at least he claimed it. But there aren't, I mean, there aren't a ton of other ones that he claims, right? I mean, it's just a handful of drinks. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's maybe 10% of the drinks yeah. in the book. The rest are mostly pretty standard. The drinks he invented, you know, uh, I don't think other than the bee's knees, there's any of them that are hugely popular today. And that one's not even hugely popular. It's just really good. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 did, did, did those come out? I think I think they, people have them, right? They, they're all, yeah. But we're people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have them. <laughs> well, the, the Olympic could have been the second yeah. class, classic one, but the well, name... Uh, the sidecar with orange juice. And he, he called it the... The Olympic. The yeah. Olympic, which now, maybe in a couple of weeks would be a good one. Uh, some people said that the sidecar was invented there at the Ritz, but he doesn't claim it and but it was certainly I think perfected there it was hmm. really the the specialty his specialty uh, they made it with old cognac from the cellars the side the sidecar is a weird drink uh, if you ever drink these uh, if you make them as most bars do today uh, with with VS cognac with you know just the standard mixing grade it doesn't taste like much you get like Cointreau, you get orange, you get maybe a hint of brandy in the back. And it, it's just, it's not a, it's not a very uh, exciting drink and it sort of missed the boat in the cocktail revival. Nobody's like running around yelling about sidecars and making sidecar t-shirts and all that Again, 2017, stuff. but the year yeah, cycle. We, we hope. But I think the secret is, is what, what Frank knew is you have to make it with old cognac, a VSOP cognac back then would have been a minimum of 10 years old, it was between, between 10 and 20, and that's just VSOP. And the older ones were older than that, and then that, that concentration of flavor, suddenly you, you taste the brandy. And, and that's you know, what he was famous for, was using very expensive old brandy from the cellars there. And, and, and the story about that is uh, Lucius Bibb. Bibb? Yeah. yeah, Bibb, yeah. Lucius Bibb uh, in 1946 in the Stork Club Bar book, he, talk, he talks about this saying, the sidecar was made in 1923 with uh, 1865 wow. uh, Grand Champagne Cognac, all right? <laughs> uh, so which which would make <laughs> Garçon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in the early 2000s, so with Colin, when he had the book from the store club and he found that, he went to the cellar and they still have in stock 1865 uh, vintage from the cuvee Ritz in the cellar. Yeah. And Phenomenal. that's when he starts making a oh, premium sidecar yeah. again. Yeah. Ooh, it's but a that's, a, that's a drink where it actually makes a difference, I yeah. think. Well, you know, many drinks it does. I was yeah. going to say it would make sense because Phylloxera obviously decimates vineyards all across mm -hmm. France, Europe, and really you, you wouldn't have cognac for you know new cognac anyway, young cognac 20, 30 years. Well, I mean. because, uh, Hectares is okay for you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, yeah. You know, before the we'll have to look in. in Cognac uh, area, it was the vineyard was two, uh, 280,000 hectares, Ooh. and in 20 years, it went down to 40,000. So we really went to a period that almost we thought Cognac would be finished. And then it was saved 
uh, thanks to American vineyard. Uh, and they were rootstock, the rootstock from, from Texas, which was uh, immune to the aphid, the, the phylloxera. The yeah. But oh. you see, it's from two, 280,000 to 40,000. So that's oh. where the myth also of cognac and prestige probably went up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess uh, uh, sort of the Hispanic shepherd, you were able to track down his uh, tombstone, Fernando. That was oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Where 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 also, is he? Also, uh, very lucky. It was uh, what two or three months ago, uh, because uh, until now uh, the Ritz themselves of the team fought. Uh, Frank Mayer died uh, in the south of France and was buried there. And the thing is that. Uh, making the, the genealogy and looking for information about his wife, uh, who was Belgian, 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 and uh, so I found the grave of his wife, and it seems I found a mention of him. I wouldn't have been there uh, because they were divorced, and he is buried in the family uh, mm. tombstone of his wife. So. If I and where and where where is the where is he buried? So it's in Paris. In Paris. Uh, but so if you go to the cemetery and you say the name of Frank Mayer, he's not in the register. Oh, it's just his wife's name. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. you can't find him, and that's why. I, Even in death, he's secret. And, uh, yeah. and by lucky, which cemetery? Uh, Pantin. Pantin. Pantin cemetery. Huh. And so it's really in the oldest one, and uh, so it was uh, and really cool to do it. And, and do you want to talk a little bit? I mean, like he after the war, you know, there are a lot of theories about why he left the Ritz and why he might have been in the south of France. Do you, do you want to talk about? I mean, we don't really know about it. Yeah. It's just the, the Ritz. I mean, it, in the end, it didn't finish very well with him. Uh, so also, he lost a lot of money. Uh, and the situation, I don't know how they stopped the contract with him because it was a little bit, from what uh, the bartenders uh, interview told me. He made the business, but he gave what he wanted to the Ritz. It's like he was his boss, and this was and the problem for the Ritz. I remember Dave, like you in yeah, that, I think it was a, it in was that a article, right? In the Sun yeah. article, it says that he he had a stake of the profits. Like yeah, a, he was, it was a, often they they sold these bars as concessions, uh, and I, I think that's he had the concession eventually. Maybe not when he started, but he ended up with the with the bar as a concession. Yeah. Proprietor, yeah, and so uh, just like you know, you see in hotels today where they uh, sell out the, uh, the the restaurants often uh, in the bars. So you get Randy Gerber's whiskey bar in, in so and so uh, such and such hotel. It's not owned by the hotel. It's not part of the hotel. That was he seemed to have the Ritz bars as 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 his own concession. So uh, all the profits went to Frank Meyer. Uh, he his he got his son enrolled in. Uh, in a uh, very fancy golf club uh, there in 1938, and uh, some of the uh, the aristocratic member members were not happy to have the son of a bartender uh, there among them. These are the, you know the people even fancier than the people who hung out at the Ritz. You know there was another level. There are levels of French society, and this was the highest level. And some of those people were not not amused at all to have this kid in there. But it, but you know clearly he could afford it, and he. S saw himself as sort of a uh, as a society figure. He was always very well dressed. He had big fancy overcoats with big fur collars, that all kind of thing. He drove. Uh, I, I think it was a Bentley. I can't remember. He drove a very fancy car, uh, or was driven in a very fancy car to work every morning. Uh, you know, there there you you pick up from gossip columns in, in old newspapers little pieces of information yeah. like that. Nothing systematic because he he wouldn't really talk to people. There's just a lot of gossip about him because he was a, an interesting figure because of uh, you know, his success and uh, the impossibility of getting a drink in his bar unless right. you were somebody. Well, and, and there's one theory that like during the war that he was possibly sort of either double billing or billing where like people were, he was telling guests to pay him, put in a London account when they I guess would settle up their monthly bar tab that he would tell them to pay yeah, into yeah. a London bank and not to the Ritz. And then, you know, that's one theory, at least that's Colin Fields' theory, who's mm -hmm. the current head bartender, that, you know, he was somehow ripping off the Ritz, um, you know, and here's a, here's a photo of Colin uh, in, up there and in the Lord mm -hmm. Hemingway, and that, you know, that it was somehow found out and that he was chased out after the war when it was revealed that, uh, 
and uh, doing the research about this seminar because he had a son and mm -hmm. his son died in 79 so I thought well we would never know anything and I discovered he has a, a granddaughter alive but I haven't been able to locate her. Yeah. I went to the latest address known in Paris. The problem, she, she moved like 10 years ago. Oh. She's around 80, so difficult to find her for the moment. <laughs> She's still heart. alive, mm -hmm. but uh, well. I mean, sort of, and, and, then, and then, you know, what you were saying that a lot of people thought that he had, had gone to the south of France. Yeah. He sort of maybe turned up there at a certain point. Um, but again, but, I mean, it's... But from, from where she was living, I can tell you, it seems that she was not very rich anymore. Right. Yeah. At so. some point. Yeah, I don't, you know... We don't know, what, we, do you know what, her, what, uh, what his son did? No. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we learned that he was working in uh, Airway. For me, the, the bartenders I interviewed, uh, they told me he was in a bank, working in a okay. bank in England. Okay. So that's why I thought I would never find him also. So, no. yeah, his son turns up in the... Uh, in the police files also after the war. Uh, they seem, the uh, post-war author authorities seemed less happy with the, the activities of the son during the war. Yes. It seems like he might have been an, an informer and uh, might have uh, been a collaborator where Frank somehow managed to be safe on both sides. So uh, that's interesting mm. too. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I mean, Maybe I, that's why he went to England. We don't know. And there, there's no, I mean, whether or not the double billing, it seems even if that was happening, the Ritz probably wouldn't have charged him because they wouldn't want that scandal. So there's such a secretive place after all. And, uh, you know, who knows? So, I mean, it's just one theory. I mean, so much of his life is still, uh, <laughs> still we don't know. Um, I mean, what we do know is, is now that this is actually the, the Ritz just reopened. It's now owned by the Al Fayed family who owns. Uh, uh, Harrods in London. Uh, uh, Princess Diana was her, her last night was was spent there. Her terrible accident was leaving the Ritz. Um, they closed for for several years. Where Colin was sort of an itinerant bartender traveling around. He was here at uh, Tales of the Cocktail a couple of years ago for a seminar, sort of uh, on retainer, making drinks on airplanes and hotels around the world for their customers, uh, going to uh, making drinks for all of their famous uh, customers and their or he was in New York a, a couple of years ago mm -hmm. uh, making drinks. I forgot for what celebrity's daughter. It was, you know, some crazy, uh, some crazy <laughs> wedding that he was involved in. <laughs> was it, was, it was kind of an amazing <laughs> life. Um, the, this is now the Bar Hemingway just reopened it. It was, it was named the Bar Hemingway in 1994. Um, obviously, the Hemingway connection uh, after World War II. Hemingway was a huge fan of the Ritz, had lived there. Or, had, had spent enough time there as well as Marcel Proust, another famous writer, had lived at the Ritz. But Hemingway, you know, the British had sort of uh, taken the hotel back from the Nazis. Hemingway um, marches in, kicks out the British and claimed that he had liberated the Ritz, you know, started drinking all the champagne in the cellars immediately. That's all, <laughs> all true. No, so, you know, so that as a, you know, tip of the hat for his uh, liberation of the hotel, you know, uh, they, they, they nicknamed it the Bar Hemingway. Obviously, you know, he'd spend quite a bit of time in the hotel, and, and you can now go back there. I think the last time I was there a couple of years ago, the drinks were a little bit more expensive than 30 cents. They were 20 euros, so... Uh, 30 now. 30 euros, 30 so, uh, you, know, it's, you know, depending upon the exchange rate, it's a little bit more than... Uh, well, you can't do what Frank did and just not serve people. Yeah. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to do the other way of keeping the riffraff out. Well, I, I guess I, I think that sort of takes us to the conclusion, Mark. Sorry, we have time for uh, questions. Well, I wanted to oh, talk just a little oh, bit about right, yeah. his influence, yeah, if sure. possible. Yeah, absolutely. One, one of the things uh, that is uh, interesting about his book is it's illustrated with little line drawings of bar gear. And you see in those photographs of him mixing drinks, right. he used a very particular kind of bar gear. And I think he really set the tone because this became... That style of cocktail shaker he used, it's, it's two cups. One of them has a little, is like a little knob that fits inside the longer bottom. Uh, Two-piece shaker uh, made by Christoffel, the great French silversmith. And he really was the flagship for this. And his line drawings are all of Christoffel stuff in yeah. here. Yeah. And it's the spoons, the the spoons yeah. and strainers, etc. cetera. And, and if you collect this uh, vintage bar here, you know this is the best stuff ever made, really. 
I mean, the most beautiful yeah, uh, it up there. bar gear. Uh, yeah, th that's a, the a shaker. A picture of the shaker. Uh, it's a little dark, but you get the sense. And it really kind of set the tone for uh, for what you use in a nice bar. Uh, yeah. When I first met Salvatore Calabrese, the great fancy Italo English uh, <laughs> bar uh, bartender, who, uh, as as he will be the first to tell you has made many drinks for the royal family in London and is just an all-around character and, 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 a, uh, and, and a, a very elegant drink mixer. He, he was using, at the time, he was using Christoffel shakers. Uh, uh, everybody in the best, the finest uh, bars in Paris you go to, the oldest bars, you still find them using this stuff. Even Harry's Bar, which is a little more rough and tumble in American style, they still use this and it really is sort of the, he, he kind of, Frank Meyer was the, uh, the, 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 the guy who kind of set the scene for this was the, the person who I think most passed this on into, into posterity, this particular style of bartending that they had. Uh, uh, you mix the drinks not in, the, in the, the mixing glass, you mix it in a beaker, you mix the, uh, you know, you use these big heavy long spoons with a, uh, uh, flat ends that you can muddle things with, these Christoffel-style spoons. You use the two-piece shaker, not the three-piece, with this lovely uh, Hawthorne strainer that doesn't have prongs in it. It's just a, a round ring that it fits down into the shaker. And it's all this, this very particular sort of bartender's kit that uh, is all illustrated very lovingly and accurately in, in his book and has become kind of the, the European, I think the continental, let's say, uh, sort of standard yeah. for elegant mixing gear and for for elegant bartending. Well, and I mean, this is stuff that important enough that it's on the cover too. I mean, obviously the shaker is is there in, in yellow. You can see it in the glass. Uh, yeah, it's it, a little hard to see from here, yeah. but but it's all on the cover. Uh, and mm. uh, it, it's it's really kind kind of kind of cool. And and if you uh, ever are lucky enough to get your hands on one of these uh, these shakers or even the bar spoon. Uh, just pay whatever they're asking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Christophe doesn't do it anymore. They don't do yeah. it anymore. I, I, I finally, over the years, managed to get my hands on three of their shakers, two large ones and a small one. And, you know, that's the, that's, that's the piece of bar gear I'll use until my, my, I mix my <laughs> final drink. It's the, just the best there ever is. Yeah. Uh, best ever made. Hopefully that won't be for a long time. another shake, which is older. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think the book being called The Artistry of Mixing Drinks is no accident. I mean, he really... Took yeah, that very seriously. He, he did take it seriously. He was, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we haven't been really talking about that side of it because the people who uh, were watching him mix drinks weren't cocktail geeks. You know, they, they were uh, industrialists and landowners and uh, celebrities of, 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 the, of, 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 of various sorts. So we, we don't have, like, really uh, great descriptions of him mixing, but when you do... Uh, come across him in like newspapers from the 1930s, uh, people discussing him, it's often with a drink recipe there or uh, you know, somebody talking about it, what the, how great his drinks were. Partly, I think, because if you could actually get one, that meant you were somebody, right. you know? Ooh. So of course it's good, but, yeah. but I think he really did take it seriously. And, and, and that that what I like is, uh, because it's, it's 1936, is the recipe are divided in cocktails and mixed drinks. Saying that mm -hmm. a mixed drink is something you build straight in the, the glass. And the cocktail is stirred or shaken because no blender was used. But right. So it means the cocktail was straight up and, and uh, so straight and up. That's, and that's an original one, right? From the one that that's is, this yeah. one. This one was uh, given to me by Bertin, the first bartender I interviewed. Wow. He was 92 years old. I interviewed him in 1999. And he worked at. I was young. And he worked uh, at the Ritz for a long time, Bertrand. Yeah, he I works. Uh, he started in 1923 and worked 49 years at the Ritz. <laughs> so wow. this one is really the exemplar that was at the bar uh, of the Ritz. Amazing. So and some I problems. And, uh, that's cool. I mean, I think it's also interesting that it's in English. I mean, we didn't really discuss yeah, that, yeah. but the fact that, I mean, he's French, it's working in a hotel in Paris, but the whole book is in English. I mean, even the, the MPL, first, yeah. I mean, he knew his clientele. He knew his clientele. I mean, who was coming there every, you know, even then people, rich people from around the world would read English. So, I mean, it's kind of amazing that it wasn't in French yeah. uh, when you think about it.
I mean, a, as a mixologist, one of my favorite cocktails is one of his own in here that nobody, nobody really makes anymore, but it's this spectacularly simple, delicious drink called the Pompadour, which is a uh, juice of a quarter lemon, so, you know, okay. maybe a little shy of a uh, half ounce of juice, maybe a third of an ounce of juice, something like that. Uh, and then it's half St. James rum, so Martinique rum. Uh, you use an aged one. And half Pompadour, which he explains, and it's a Pinot de Charente. Mm. And, and, and for sweetness. And it's this simple three ingredient drink that is just so delicious and cool. I actually use lime juice in it, maybe a little more than he said, because uh, the, the Pinot is very sweet. But it's just, you know, half and half uh, of these, these two simple ingredients. Uh, both very French, you know, Martinique rum is, is as French as you can get. Martinique yeah. is a part of France. And even for the bartenders in France, until the 60s, is it? White rum was Cuban style, mm. and uh, aged rum was Martinique. Uh, okay. Yeah, and this was uh, St. James, an old producer, and a good one. And yeah, you know, it's, and, it's, it's and a Saint couple James, years old. Just to say, today it's not what it was, but in 1887, when Charlie Paul, in his cocktail book in 1887 in London, St. James was doing already uh, 16 years old rum. So, yeah, and you knew he had good old rum. Yeah. And, and the Pinot de Charente, nobody ever uses yeah. that in cocktails. No, cocktails. No. And it's such a, and this is, this is like this oh, rare, really creative touch for a simple drink using unusual ingredients yeah. that's absolutely delicious. And you make it and you're, you're like, where the hell did this come from? <laughs> and the, you know, it's one of those things, that it's, it's like having right. a drink from Constante at the Floridita. If, in, in Cuba, if you ever mix any of the old Floridita recipes, they're all startlingly good. And this is one of those that's like, okay, this guy, you know, he actually knew what he was doing. Yeah. There's, it, it, it's not just that he was, uh, you know, wiping the bums of, uh, of, uh, of, of a very fastidious and rich clientele. He also, he knew how to tend bar. He knew how to mix drinks. Yeah, and, the, and the recipe, uh, many of his creations are so simple. Yeah, I mean, it's so absolutely. purist approach. And I mm. think in that sense that Colin is a, is a real uh, following the oh, same absolutely. I mean, I, I think if you go to the bar Hemingway now yeah. and you expect, you know, fanciful, you know, 10 ingredient drinks, it's not, that's not what you're going to find. And, and the ones that he invented himself, a lot of them are very, yeah. very simple, very, you know, takeaways, uh, if anything, almost understated uh, given their, their um, astronomical price. Um, it's kind of interesting, but but thank you all so much for attending. Thank you for the panelists, for all of your research. Oh, and if you do feedback, you get a chance to win a conga shaker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.